last time on how to win the loser's game. Really the cornerstone of all what we call modern portfolio theory rests on this idea of diversification. We happen to know small stocks tend to move together and big stocks tend to move together. Will it be effective in the future? Possibly. A model stands until it doesn't stand anymore, until a better one comes along. So how can ordinary investors apply that academic research, the lessons learned from more than 100 years of rigorous research? How can they apply that to achieving their financial goals? Well, this might sound dramatic, but the work of Louis Bichelier and of Nobel Prize winners like Samuelson, Sharp and Farmer should make us question everything we thought we knew about investing. And almost everything the industry and the media is telling us we should be doing. Most of all, the evidence should make us extremely wary of anyone who claims that they have the knowledge to beat the market. Because markets are fundamentally efficient, consistent outperformance is almost impossible. So instead of paying large sums in fees to active fund managers to deliver average returns, we should invest instead in passive funds that simply track an index at a much lower cost. Ultimately though, it's not about theories or intellectual arguments at all. It all boils down to simple mathematics. If you think about a marketplace and you think about a strategy in which an investor buys a proportionate share of all the securities. So if you have 1% of the money in the market, you buy 1% of each of the stocks. You buy 1% of each of the amounts of each of the bonds outstanding. So you have this truly representative market portfolio. If you think about that strategy, and then you think about all the people engaging in other strategies, active strategies, holding disproportionate amounts of this or that, then you ask at the end of any period, be it a year, a month, you name it, uh, what did the passive investors, the index fund folks, earn before costs? And let's say that's 12%, just to take a number. And then you ask, what did the average euro or whatever currency it may be invested by all the active managers earn before costs? It has to be the same number. If the total made 12% and a subset made 12%, or the other bunch, the average euro in that sector, had to make the same amount before costs. After costs, it's a different story. A well-designed index fund should have a very low cost of management. It should have very low turnover, very low transactions costs. Actively managed funds, by their very nature, have higher management fees. They employ more skilled people. They also have transactions costs because they're active. So net of costs, the average euro in the passive sector must outperform the average euro in the active sector, and that's just arithmetic. Despite the mathematical superiority of passive investing and the welter of empirical evidence supporting it, the industry has always tried to discredit it. When Vanguard introduced its first index fund in 1976, the idea was slated. And Mr. Johnson, the head of Fidelity, said, I can't imagine our shareholders would ever settle for average results. They expect to be superior. Famous poster came out in Wall Street. Stamp out index funds. They're un-American. And there was Uncle Sam with a cancel stamp. Bam, 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 bam. Canceling all the stock certificates. Among the many kind of claims, you can imagine all this. Uh, you wouldn't settle for an average brain surgeon if you needed brain surgery. Uh, so why would you settle for an average manager? As if there's any relevance to those two very different things. It was Bogle who had the last laugh. Vanguard now has more assets under management than any other company in the world, including Fidelity, which incidentally is now the second biggest provider of index funds. And yet, even in the United States, where passive has a bigger market share than in the UK, active remains by far the most popular way to invest. I laugh because, you know, I've been telling the same story for 52 years now. <laughs> 
<laughs> We've gone from zero passive investing up to about 20 or 30 percent in the U.S. market, so it's very slow. <laughs> Penetration is, is, is very slow. So what, what I like to remind people, though, is that active management is a zero-sum game before costs. The whole cost argument uh, from an investment perspective is actually counterintuitive. You know, if you think about your life in other areas, so if you're out buying a car and, you know, you can buy a Rolls Royce and pay, you know, whatever Rolls Royces are going for today, or you can buy uh, an inexpensive Hyundai, you're going to feel a difference in the car. Now, whether it's worth that, you know, that huge price differential to you, only you as a, as a buyer can uh, make that decision. But you're, you're definitely going to feel there's a difference in quality in terms of durability and so forth. In investing, that's, that, doesn't, that equation does not hold. And so when you think about the average investor who's also a consumer and you know, they're used to the, the more I pay, the higher the quality, typically the better the results I get, um, you come to investing and it's just the opposite. And you know, I think that's a really hard behavior uh, for people to unlearn. Perhaps surprisingly, another long-standing advocate of passive investing is the most famous active investor of all. Warren Buffett once said, when the dumb investor realises how dumb he is and buys an index fund, he becomes smarter than the smartest investors. More recently, Buffett gave this instruction to the trustee of his estate. Put 10% of the cash in short-term government bonds and 90% in a very low-cost index fund. The long-term results from this policy will be superior to those attained by most investors, whether pension funds, institutions or individuals who employ high-fee managers. Warren Buffett is sort of a contradiction here, and so people take what they want to hear from Buffett. And the contradiction is this. Clearly, Buffett believes the efficient market hypothesis isn't correct. And he himself has said, if, if it was true, I wouldn't be here. And people like me and Charlie Munger would not get the great results. On the other hand, Buffett has told people in advice in his 1996 shareholder letter, he said to people, it, he, he said the following, if you invest in an index fund, you're virtually guaranteed to outperform the vast majority of investors, both institutional and individual. Virtually guaranteed. Now, it's only virtually guaranteed because he doesn't know if you're going to be able to stay the course. If he knew you'd stay the course, which is the second part of it, he would, rec he would say it is guaranteed. It's simple math. Passive investors must outperform active investors in aggregate because they have less costs. If you look in the mirror and see Warren Buffett or maybe Charlie Munger or Peter Lynch, go ahead and invest and try to pick stocks and beat the market. The rest of the world looking in the mirror doesn't see such a sight. And then I would suggest you should follow Buffett's advice and you should invest in index funds or other passively managed funds. In recent years, even the great Warren Buffett has failed to beat index funds after costs. It's little wonder then that increasingly fund managers themselves are starting to acknowledge that this really is a loser's game. I think I realized it years ago when I was a full-time active investment manager. And there were times when we, we could beat the index, we, we made the right calls and that was very satisfying, but it was extremely difficult to sustain it year after year. And the more research I did into it, the more I realized there were very few people who were able to sustain our performance sufficiently to cover all the extra costs of active investing. So I gradually came to the view that a fund should have rather more in index tracking than was then common. In those days, I think I favored some sort of mixture. More recently, the more I've looked at the buildup of numbers, the more I think it is it's very difficult to find those star managers who are going to win. And there's always the danger that they had a very good strategy that works for two, three, five years. You then buy in because you were persuaded. And that may be just the point where that strategy starts to go wrong through no particular fault of their own. Fashions come and go, and quite a lot of so-called stellar management performance is just being on the right particular uh, theme at a time when that's popular in the market. So the fund management industry won't tell you this, it has far too much to lose by doing so. But the most appropriate investment vehicle for the vast majority of investors is the humble index fund.
No, it's not perfect. We'll explain why later. And although it's a relatively simple way to invest, requiring very little maintenance, there are still some very important decisions for index fund investors to make. There is really no such thing as passive investing because you have to choose where the money's going to go. Somebody has to choose if the money's going to be in Japan or South America or, you know, emerging market bonds or Russia or whatever it is. Those decisions have to be made. Those are active decisions. Then, once you've made those decisions, you're choosing the ETF or you're choosing the tracker, whatever it is. And in doing that, you're choosing a strategy. But there is another much bigger issue that needs to be addressed. As we've heard, passive investing is still far less popular than active. But what if that changed? What if passive continues to grow? And eventually, most people decided to invest passively. Here is how the perfect world of the, the Chicago efficient markets theory of finance works. We all get religion and we all just index. And then one guy thinks, oh, you know what? The new iPhone is great. I'd like to buy Apple. Apple's only, say, $500 a share. It's worth $1,000. i am going to buy some Apple. So he says, hey guys, I'll buy your Apple. I want six, I'll offer you $600 a share. And we say, we're just indexers. We're not gonna alter our market weights. You must know something we don't know. So we're, not, we're gonna hold Apple in its market weights. But things. Yes, oh gosh. How about 700? We're just indexers. And then finally he bids the price up to the $1,000 a share. So the ideal world, this isn't the real world. The ideal world, if we all indexed, we would never lose to the active managers because we would never sell and they would just bid the prices up so prices reflect information. You can see the hole in the story. The active manager should go drive a cab. He's not earning any money. Our world is one in which active managers do trade, and they trade and make money, and they bring the information in. The big puzzle is, who trades against them? Why don't we defend those of us who don't know anything? Why don't we defend ourselves just by indexing? Next time on How to Win the Losers Game. I think the, the name is unfortunate in that it, it seems to suggest that it's, uh, it's a smart outcome when, when in fact um, smart is a requirement when it comes to, to smart beta as it's called. The best question an investor can ask is where do returns come from and really no one has studied this more deeply than the academic community. What is the risk? Why are some people not willing to bear that risk? Why can't I bear that risk? Is a good place to start thinking about what are these alternative data you want to invest.